Okay, thank you. Hi, um, it is my great pleasure to talk about our work on analysis of JavaScript web applications in the wild, mostly slackly today. And as Kathleen said in the morning, I'm going to give an invited talk this Tuesday. So in that talk, I'm going to give a high-level overview of our journey towards that goal, like you know, a series of trials and errors and all that. But this talk is going to be talk about only one specific thing between them. And this work is a collaborative work with my awesome programming language research group at KAIST, as shown in this picture, a gang of students, and um, collaboration with industry like Escore, Samsung Electronics, IBM Research in US, and HK, Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. Okay, so this is the um, title, and actually this talk is large based on our paper titled Battles with False Positives in Static Analysis of JavaScript Web Applications in the Wild. So um, I think that many of the audience may not be familiar with the static analysis or JavaScript. So I'm going to give a little bit of a background, but more details are going to be available this Tuesday. Okay, <laughs> it's an advertisement for my invited talk. So. You know, for a given program, it would be great if there are no bugs, but it's not like that. The life is so miserable, right? So, for a given program, we'd like to identify exact set of bugs in them, but it's undecidable. So, most static analysis have many false positives, and that's the bit that real de developers hate about. So, in this picture, of those like Greyhound. Uh, what do you call that? Yeah, it's Greyhound. They are like, you know, popping up, right, uh, from the ground, and we'd like to catch them all, like get rid of all those false positives. And I'm going to talk about that in a minute. So what are web applications? There are many web applications these days, meaning um, and they are running everywhere if it has a browser meaning that your laptop, your desktop, your smartphone, or whatever wearable devices, they have browsers and they can run JavaScript web applications. They are written in HTML for like DOM structure and showing you the structure. And CSS is for the visual rendering. And JavaScript is for user interaction. And there are many platforms like Windows, Android, iOS, and Tizen, things like that. And um, user wants to talk with them, but it's going to be rel related to with multiple languages. And in order to sell your cool applications like games or whatever that you developed, then you need to run them on multiple platforms. And that's why these web applications are everywhere these days. And this cute example is a sample game from Tizen. And Tizen is an open source platform developed by um, Samsung and other people. And it's um, Linux Foundation. And this game is called Run, Rabbit Run. It's like a game called Minesweeper, if you've heard of it. So um, the user clicks this grid, and they, uh, the user wants to get all those carrots before the rabbit is being caught by several foxes. So this is cool game, cute. And um, behind the back, there are many things happening. And actually, if we click this button, it's a settings button. And there are um, sound effects, hints, best time, uh, clearing those scores in the level of different difficulties. And if you click one of those clear button, even before running the game, and there's going to be an uncut type error exception. You may not see that if you just use the game, but if you open the, this in the console window, then you're going to see that. Actually, it's not only this cute game. If you visit many websites like uh, what wikipedia.org or amazon.com, google.com, if, if you see this console window, you're going to be amazed by the amount of uncut exceptions behind your back. 
That's all from JavaScript, right? And in this particular example, the thing is that these clear buttons, they are going to get some value from this variable, which is going to keep the best score of that level. And that variable is going to be initialized when you start a game. So if you do not start a game, just click the button, then that variable will have a value called undefined. Undefined is a value of JavaScript. So if you click the button, then we are asking some property of the undefined value, throwing this exception. And there are many errors like that. And if you Google for JavaScript errors, you're going to see many cool examples, like um, what eBay.com, and you're going to see some pictures with the products with NAN, not a number of values. So what do we want to do? We'd like to save the word. We'd like to detect these bugs before running them. So static analysis, meaning that static means that it's before running, before runtime. If we are going to catch bugs at runtime, it's too late. It's not like rocket launching or things like that, but still, it, you may lose some money or time, anything like your precious stuff. So we'd like to analyze the programs at compile time and identify possible errors there. And the traditional approach is to value soundness. So soundness, meaning that when an analyzer says, oh, here's a list of bugs that this program may have, that should include all the possible bugs there. That means sound. It's so beautiful and perfect, right? But the thing is that, as I said before, identifying the exact set of errors is undecidable, so it's going to include some false positives. That's nice in theory, but in practice, that's way more than true alarms, right? So true alarms meaning the actual bugs in the program, and false alarms meaning that to be sound, we'd like to capture all possible execution flows so that we cannot miss any real errors. So this is the actual story and usual papers, publication from cool conferences. So we also, I'm going to talk more about that this Tuesday. And um, so we were happy writing the papers. We are happy working on JavaScript, but JavaScript developers hated us. Like, what are you doing? OK, you're writing papers. You're developing something, but not for us. Those languages in your paper with this kind of lambda calculus with operational semantics and type system, they are not JavaScript. They are some imaginary core of JavaScript that we do not use every day. And you are working on that because that's easy. So you're like, hmm, what, what, what are we going to do? Because you know, Samsung has been funding us for several years because they had lots of source code like C, C++, Java. They know a lot about C. And they have their in-house tool for C programs, large code base. And they know a little bit about Java, how to analyze them, but not really about JavaScript. That's why they have been working with us for the last five years. So we were like, OK, how can you help them? Like, I know program languages. I love mathematics. I love logicians, like Philip said this morning, right? And the thing is that that's really cool for my pedant pedantic hat, right? But it's not really for real programmers. How can we help them? So we, I, we collected 30,000 web applications from Samsung. Uh, let me think. I think we, yeah, these things are all public. We use some market applications that we could not open to the public, but these three apps are going to be available. And we analyze them and using our tool called SAFE, Scalable Analysis Framework for ECMAScript. ECMAScript is another name for JavaScript. And we analyze them, these 30 apps, and find that there are only 55 tree alarms and 334 false alarms. So kind of embarrassed. So we looked at them, manually identified them, and identified um, seven causes of those false alarms. Uh, see, number one, W3C APIs, meaning that JavaScript applications usually embedded in HTML documents. So HTML documents are usually the entry points to that, like wikipedia.org or some game applications, and they embed some JavaScript code in it to do some user interaction. 
HTML documents may load JavaScript code statically, and that JavaScript code may load JavaScript code at runtime. So those JavaScript code is not available at compile time. So what can we do? Pure static analysis cannot even see them, right? And so there are many issues like that. Yeah, dynamic file loading. Files are loaded at runtime. Dynamic code generation. JavaScript can generate code at runtime. Isn't it cool? Right? Have you heard of the eval function, that evil eval function? <laughs> right? And there are many asynchronous calls and AJAX, things like that. They are really difficult problems. So we are now focusing on these parts today. And actually, we are working on these parts as well at the moment, but I'm not going to talk about that in this talk. And this talk is more interested in easier problems. The first one is W3C APIs, meaning those HTML um, functions like document get by document by ID things like that sorry for the names I'm bad at rem remembering the names and browser specific APIs I'm going to show you a sample code in a minute JavaScript libraries the number one JavaScript library is called jQuery that has 96 percent market share and it's a beast and I'm going to show you some the sample I mean uh, structure of the code later uh, on Tuesday, and then dynamic file loading. So what is this browser-specific API? This is a really common pattern in JavaScript web applications. Let's see. It says window dot request animation frame, whatever that means, that's an API. Window is the global object. All, most of the things are going to be reachable from the top level called the window object. And that thing is, you know what? Mm, if you are using a browser, Chrome and Opera, that's going to be the name WebKit Request Animation Frame. If you, are happen, if you happen to use Firefox, the name is going to be Mose Request Animation Frame. If you are using an old version of Opera, it's going to be old Request Animation Frame like that. If you are not using all of them, use this function. Cool, right? This is to support backward compatibility between different versions of Opera and different browsers. So thoughtful and you know considerate. The thing is that even though that works for many browsers with different versions, it's really a killer for static analysis. As I said, static analysis wants to be perfect by collecting all possible execution flows for every possible browser with every version, meaning losing all the precision. We cannot guarantee any specific browser at compile time because I don't know what your browser is. So that's the basic problem. So we are just losing the game if we are going to stick to a pure static analysis. So that made us to change our attitude. I love ML, I admire Haskell, I really like Scala, but this is JavaScript. We are talking about some other language. So what we are trying to do is to solve those problems by using three simple techniques. They are so simple that if you hear that, you're like, ha, huh, they are so simple, but they worked really well. So I will tell you one by one. The first technique is going to be JavaScript file pass loading. The second technique is snapshot. And the third is using a model. So let's see. JavaScript file path. It's really simple, just like this. If you are going to analyze this JavaScript web application, just run it and record all those files loaded dynamically. Guaranteed it's unsound, right? Because this run loaded these set of files, then another run may load different files, but yeah, I know. Otherwise, we cannot even start. So we want to analyze a fraction of the execution flows, but we'd like to detect some bugs. We may miss some bugs, yeah, but we can find some bugs in there. So let's see. Um, actually, we looked among those 30,000 apps. We found that seven apps were loading files at runtime. And uh, actually, we can collect all those JavaScript files in the package, right? So one obvious sol solution, maybe just collect all those JavaScript files and analyze them. 
That's one option, right? So actually, yeah, this memory match and 10 frame, they, you, they included 13 and 15 JavaScript files. At, static, at compile time, they only, uh, only one file each was accessible. But at runtime, all of them were being used. So it's a good approach. We tried that in the beginning. And not long, <laughs> we found that there are applications with 422 JavaScript files or even 300 and 700 files. And at runtime, only a fraction of them are being used. What's happening there, right? So that thing was flashcards application. There were three, wait, 409 test files for required JS. They were happen to be integrated in the application. So we didn't analyze them. For this one, UB radioactive, 300 something files were about international locale setting. So among those 325, I think, only one file is going to be used for your locale, like Japan or Korea. This is 700, you can guess now, right? There are two directories with them. <laughs> Isn't it crazy? So this is real world. So we uh, analyzed them and we were like, okay, we are going to give up with the soundness analysis. We may miss some errors, but we are going to find some errors. And then this one worked really well. The second technique. Snapshot. It's related to this web browsing. I mean, the execution environment. If you read that official JavaScript specification called ECMAScript, it says that every JavaScript code is running on a host environment. And the host environment is going to be like web browsers or some platforms. Tizen specific or Android or something like that. And the thing is, every browser has a different set of API functions. They're going to include all those W3C APIs and their own lovely browser specific functions. So we don't want to support them all. So what we did is to have a built in. Um, snapshot is a built-in heap of a JavaScript execution environment. Instead of considering all those possible environment, having a big set of all those functions, we have we developed a capturing app. It's a very simple JavaScript embedded in a, another very simple HTML document. It's going to just dump all the initial information for each browser. That's it, right? When we want to analyze some web applications and find bugs in them, we'd like to find bugs in user code. Yeah, if we analyze that initial you know, status too, we may be able to find bugs in the browser code, but that's not our goal here. We are more like cautious. So what we are going to do is to run this capturing app for each browser, for the Chrome and for the Internet Explorer and Tizen, and get that snapshot for each browser. And then we are going to ask user to tell us what browser are you using, which version. Then we can reuse the initial snapshot to get a precise information about the execution environment. So one may say that, hey, this technique is again unsound. You are not addressing all those behaviors. Yeah, yeah. But we are sound for a given browser with a given version, right? So that's kind of a twisting the view. And we are more focusing on the developer's needs than our desire to be a sound. So this was our work. Um, and the third well, approach was to using model. Any real world web application are going to use lots of libraries. There are JavaScript libraries that I mentioned, like jQuery, Mootools, uh, what else? You name it. There's a lot. And one good thing about JavaScript is that it's really freestyle. There is no standardization. Many libraries and, you know, it's so, uh, you know, not disciplined in my view, but they are really extremely freestyle. So for a function, it may be declared with two parameters, but at the function call side, you can give any number of arguments. 
and you can pass any value so that one chapter in the language specification can convert the value appropriately. And one chapter describes those implicit type conversion between different types. So that's really cool language, right? And then another thing, if we are gonna use web applications that take advantage of platform specific functions, like uh, what is your contact number? I mean, what is your phone number? What is your geographic location? Things like that. They are gonna be given by platform specific functions that may be written in native code, like C++ or Android Java or Swift. So all those things are usually modeled. In this example, I'm showing you a jQuery function. Well, jQuery is a JavaScript library. It's written in JavaScript. If your analyzer is good enough, you can analyze it itself, just like a JavaScript. We can do that too, um, but it's not, it takes some time, right? Or you may want to hardwire the modeling. You may want to model it, um, in your analyzer, or you can do whatever. And this one, this is just an example. Say um, this dollar denotes a jQuery function, and it calls a jQuery function called add class, which returns yet another jQuery object. And then on that result, it's gonna call another jQuery function called CSS, which returns yet another jQuery object. And then another call and another call is like that. If you do not analyze jQuery functions, then you cannot analyze this single expression. So there are several ways. You may want to analyze the jQuery source code as it is, or you may want to analyze them or model them in a labor intensive way, or you can simulate that analysis from type specification. So this was our approach to automatically model stuff out of type specification. This one said, this one is all written in TypeScript in this example, but it doesn't need to be TypeScript. It could be any web IDL languages. This one says, add class. Actually, there are multiple versions. Those functions are overloaded, but I'm, gonna, I'm showing you specific ones that are being used in this example. Add class, it takes one parameter of type string. Um, and CSS, it takes two parameters. The first one is a string. The second one is either string or number, returns a jQuery, things like that. Taking this specification, we automatically model that and return a fake jQuery object so that we can just keep going on the analysis. Guaranteed, it's unsound. Why? This modeling only simulates type behavior, right? We check whether those arguments match these types. If not, we can signal type errors. We simulate that those results are jQuery, but we do not simulate any side effects, any behavior inside the actual library function. So in that sense, it's unsound, but at least it connects the dots so that we can go on. Later, when we have a better model, then we can use that. Later, when we have a better way to simulate the side effectful behavior, we are gonna use that on top of this scenario. So that's good. Okay, so those three techniques, very simple techniques, but they worked really well. We evaluated this work in three metrics, precision, coverage, and scalability. I'm gonna only show you some precision results. Ooh, true positive was increased 30, 36, right? Isn't it cool? And false positive, let's see, we narrowed down 120 false positives, but incre increased 26. Those increased false positives are introduced from new analysis scope, meaning that those dynamically loaded files that we couldn't analyze in the beginning. By analyzing more code, uh, we have some more um, false positives and true positives. And back to those seven reasons, we are not gonna talk about those three that we, are, we didn't care to eliminate. W3C, yeah, it's reduced a bit, but still a lot of chunks there. And we eliminated all those browser-specific APIs by using snapshot information. We could eliminate many things, increased post positives are again from this new, newly analyzed source code. 
So it worked pretty well. Yeah. So that, um, you know, there are several papers in the top software engineering conferences like, why do developers hate static analysis? Why don't they use static analyzers? Things like that. And we are talking with real Samsung developers a lot, quite often, and they are like, uh, we don't want to look at hundreds hundreds of you know, alarms that, that who cares they are true or not. Another thing is that now this is an open source era, right? No one knows the actual code. Who wrote that part? That's not me. I don't know. That's an open source from some third party code. I don't know why there is a problem, things like that. So Peter Warren from um, Facebook, he's saying that maybe true positive and false positive is too much academic. We may want to talk about how much fix rates are there. And with this example, we have really high fix rate that when we, uh, it's a slightly different work, but anyway, so when we talk communicated with Samsung developers, we reported, for example, 88 errors. And they fixed 80 out of 88. It's like 91%, it's a really high fix rate. I think that they fixed them because they were not sure whether that's true or not. And fixing it is easier than identifying whether that's true or not. But still, they fixed them and uh, the work was well received. And it's now officially integrated in the Tizen SDK. So that's, um, that's the end of today's talk and more about the other parts. I'm gonna talk about that on Tuesday. Thank you. Any questions? Yes? What's the name of your static analyzer? Right. So th the question was, what's the name of our static analyzer? It's Safe Scalable Analysis Framework for ECMAScript, S-A-F-E. Yeah, and it's gonna, it is open source right now, and we are revamping it and release the Safe 2.0, hopefully at the end of September. So stay tuned. It's gonna be cool. Okay. Yes. Functional programming. I mean, quick check is from functional programming language, right? John is John here. Over there, yay, the father of quick check is <laughs> there. <laughs> and yeah, so quick check is really cool idea. And actually, um, I was when I was at Sun Labs, we developed a fortress programming language, and we also had fortress check. So quick check for fortress. And, um, uh, but it's uh, slightly different. Quick check is more like, uh, can I say that's more testing, John? Yeah, and this is for static analysis, meaning that we'd like to analyze them, detect bugs before running them. With this real world web applications, you may not be able to run them. For a specific example, Samsung has this really huge JavaScript web applications that they couldn't show us. Uh, so we had to go there and see them. And actually it was like aut automatic configuration of network drivers in Samsung some part. So a lot of code, they cannot even run them. I mean, that specific network department can run them, but not software engineering team at Samsung. So running them is really hard, with, and we'd like to analyze them without running it. Okay? okay thank you. Very much. Thank you.